because today is the start of the Passion Week, the week in which Jesus came to fulfill all that God had set into plan all those years before when we were first created. And so I've entitled my sermon this morning, Christ the King. Recently, I had a conversation with a member from another church in which I was asked a very interesting question. We had been speaking about Jesus and his earthly ministry and everything he had been doing, everything he had been proclaiming, everything he had already done. When kind of out of the blue, she said to me, Graham, do I worship the right Messiah? And I must admit, at first the question caught me a little off guard. But as she expounded on her question, I began to see more clearly what her dilemma was. She had been listening to a sermon on YouTube that caused her some conflict. Because as she listened, she very quickly realized that unfortunately, in the world we live in today, there are many different Jesuses. This is a very sad reality. Let me explain. According to the Center of Study for Global Christianity, there are currently 45,000 different denominations around the world. And a lot of these denominations have been formed by differing opinions on who Jesus is and what Jesus came to do. And this is not a modern controversy. In fact, I had an unexpected conversation about it this morning. As early as the 4th century AD, we have the Iranian controversy in which Arius a priest from Alexandria in Egypt claimed that because Jesus was begotten or brought about by God, he was a lesser divinity than God. Basically, he was not God. This caused a major stir in the early church, as I'm sure you can imagine, and eventually led to the Council of Nicaea, where a group of theologians and scholars were gathered together by the Emperor Constantine I. And there, after much deliberation, they ultimately sided against Arius. And their reason for standing against him was simple. They could not find sufficient evidence in the scriptures to back his claims. I mean, one need only look at what Jesus said about himself, and this would have sorted that heresy out. If we look at the Gospel of John chapter 10, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. But I digress. As we look around at the various denominations today, we see clear evidences of differing views of Jesus. And perhaps one of the most popular at the moment actually sees Jesus as a genie. Because after all, Jesus is just here to answer every demand we make of him. And if he does not give us exactly what we want, when we want it, it is a problem with our faith. They turn to Jesus as a God of health, wealth, and prosperity. Something I struggle to find in the scriptures. We need only look at the sermon I preached two weeks back that says our suffering is inevitable. And this was exactly why the woman asked me the question that she did. Because she struggled to see the Jesus of the Bible in so many of the teachings of your more popular pastors today. And why? 
while the Apostle Paul says it best. A time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers who suit their own passions. You see, beloved, Far too often we build up expectations of the Messiah that are not based off of the scriptures. And beloved, this is what we will see in this morning's scripture readings. Because we should not forget that the very people laying down their coats and the palm branches will be the same people calling for his crucifixion. In just a few days. And why? Because he did not do what they wanted him to do. Though they recognized him as king, they were expecting a militant liberator, not a suffering servant. William Hendrickson says, Jesus shows the crowds what kind of Messiah he is, namely, not the earthly Messiah of Israel's dreams, the one who wages wars against an earthly oppressor, but the one who came to promote and establish the things that make for peace, lasting peace, reconciliation between God and man, reconciliation between man and man. And so as we turn our attention to the scripture reading for this morning, we'll be breaking it into two parts. First, we'll be looking at verses 1 to 6, the anticipated king, followed by verses 7 to 11, the true king. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 6 says, As they approached Jerusalem, and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. Beloved, the week of the Passion, which is followed by the Resurrection, begins here. And so in order to gain a better understanding of the events that are about to take place, we are going to rewind a little bit to see the journey that led Jesus and his disciples to arriving at this point. If we turn back just a little in Matthew, he has informed us of Jesus leaving Perea, crossing the Jordan, and in Jericho, restoring the sight of two blind men. From Jericho, Jesus and his disciples made their way to Jerusalem. And on reasonable grounds, it may be assumed that they reached Bethany before sunset on Friday. And it is helpful here to note that for the Jewish community, Sabbath is celebrated from sunset on Friday to sunset on Saturday. Now Bethany was the home of Simon the leper, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. So Jesus would have enjoyed his Sabbath rest with his friends. And on the Saturday evening, a dinner was given in his honor. The next day, being Sunday, sees Jesus and his disciples departing from Bethany and making their way towards Bethpage. And it is at this point that Jesus instructs two of his disciples to go and fetch a donkey and her colt. Now there is much debate surrounding the collection of these animals. Did Jesus prearrange for the collection of the animals? 
did he by his divine nature know of the donkey's whereabouts? Or had he been informed by a passerby or traveler as they made their way to Jerusalem? Beloved, this should not distract us from the purpose of these events. The fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus was revealing himself as the one the prophets had spoken of. And it can be seen in Jesus' very direct statement of his lordship. As he tells the disciples, if anyone says anything to you, say, the Lord needs them. Not your Lord, not the Lord of. The Lord, signifying the fact that he is Lord of all. And before we as readers are informed of how the disciples fared, Matthew marks this event as the fulfillment of the prophecy made in Zechariah chapter 9. The humble yet great, lowly yet exalted king is about to make his triumphant entry. Though in no uncertain terms, he is the one who in this very act is riding to his death and thus to his victory. A victory not only for himself, but a victory for all those who are known and loved by him. And the sad reality is that this is the very reason the same people we are going to read about now would in just a few days call for his crucifixion. Because as I said earlier, they were expecting a militant, political Messiah, not the humble, gentle, suffering servant who would reveal his true kingship by laying down his life for those he loves and has set apart. Matthew chapter 21 verses 7 to 11 says, They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is that? The crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Beloved, everything happens just as Jesus said it would. The disciples find the donkey and her colt exactly where Jesus said they would. And in the Gospel of Luke, we learn that as they were unhitching them, the owners did come out and object to their livestock just being taken. But as Jesus instructed the disciples, they informed the owners that the Lord needs them. And without further debate, they were released. And the donkeys were brought to Jesus. So the king takes his place on the donkey, and his entry begins. And having witnessed the disciples laying down their coats for Jesus to sit on, the crowds now begin to lay down their coats and palm branches before the king's noble steed. And the use of the branches to pave the way recalls the people of Israel waving palm branches in celebration as their enemies were expelled from Jerusalem during the Maccabean revolts which once again suggests the political expectations of the Messiah, which is further seen in their cries of Hosanna. Hosanna meaning save now or save pray, 
there is a clear combination of both prayer and praise. And as one commentator says, perhaps it could be understood as the people saying, we beseech thee, O Lord, save now, grant victory and prosperity at this time, since because of thy goodness, the appropriate moment has arrived. And by the proclamation of Jesus as the son of David, there is a confirmation of the crowd's perception that he is in fact their long-awaited Messiah, which does not contradict their description of Jesus as a prophet in verse 11. This was merely the reputation he had built up during his earthly ministry. But now, they saw before them the Messiah that Zechariah had prophesied would come. And so quoting Psalm 118, the crowd sings his praises. And beloved, I would encourage you to read Psalm 118. It really is a beautiful psalm. And perhaps if the crowd had understood Psalm 118 alongside Isaiah chapter 53 and Zechariah chapter 9, they would have recognized in Jesus the Messiah who came to set his people free from the grip of sin, the one and only Savior of the world. But nonetheless, the cries of Hosanna and shouts in honor of Jesus cause an overflow of excitement. And as is natural, curiosity creeps in. What is going on? Who is this? And it is with pride that the Jews from Galilee claim him as their very own prophet. Because surely they were about to witness the start of the Messiah's rule on earth. No longer would they be oppressed. No longer would those of other beliefs from different nations be able to rule over them and force them to follow their practices and their ways. So perhaps the expectation was that Jesus, the Messiah, was going to march up to the temple and with a loud cry announce their liberation and the institution of their rule. For surely now, they were going to be the most powerful of all nations. No one would defeat them with the Messiah at the reins. But, this is not why the Messiah had come. And though it was their desire, Jesus would not be a political, militant leader. The Messiah they wanted was not the Messiah the prophets had said would come. So beloved, my question to you this morning is this. Which Jesus do you serve? Which Messiah do you worship? There are many different Jesuses in the world today. But there is only one true Jesus. And that is the Jesus of the Bible. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is one with the Father and the Spirit. He was in the beginning, and everything that was created was created through Him. And no one comes to the Father but through Him. For our salvation is made complete in Him and in Him alone. And though many will claim to know Him, their lives will give evidence to the fact that they are not known by Him. As believers, we are 
called to submit ourselves to him fully. And all that we do should be for his glory. And though we will fall short, when we are weak, he is strong. He is the author and the perfecter of all things. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And his command for us is to love as he loved. Beloved, turn to the Jesus we find in the pages of this beautiful book. The one that turned your heart of stone to a heart of flesh. When you worship the Messiah, know that you are worshipping God incarnate. Very God. And very man, sinless and blameless, righteous and holy, perfect and sovereign. In the words of David Zimmer, Christ our glory, Christ our hope, Christ our King forevermore. Come joy or come sorrow, whatever befalls. The light of the Savior will outshine them all. Let us pray. Almighty and sovereign God, in a world so full of deception, we pray this morning that you would keep our eyes fixed on you that we would not seek the many versions of you this world has created, but instead turn to the Bible and get to know you that much better. Lord God, this week is both a week of mourning and celebration as we see you suffer and die, and yet on the third day rise again, defeating death, Defeating the grip that sin once had on us. Lord, we believe. Help us in our unbelief. Lord God, this morning we pray for the hearts of all those who are here this morning. You know our hearts. You know our desires. You know our needs. You know where we struggle. Draw near to us. And answer our prayers. Lord God, we think of all those who could not be with us this morning. May your spirit draw near to them that they may feel your presence and be comforted by you. Lord God, this morning we think of Dale and Karen Fullion, for Betty Pretorius, for Sue Hay, for Henny De Beer, for Malcolm and Anne Brown. For Sari van der Heerfe, for Sue Robertson, and for Mia Fryer. Lord God, may your hand of healing rest on them. May your grace and your mercy surround them. Lord God, we pray for the UPCSA and all her leaders. Lord God, grant them your wisdom. May they be drawn to your word. May they be drawn to the teaching of your word. May they be faithful to you. Lord God, this morning we pray for our beautiful country. We pray for our president and for all our leaders. That by your grace and your mercy, they would know you as Lord and Savior of all. That they would see you as the one true king reigning over us all. Grant them your wisdom. Lord God, with upcoming elections, we pray that you would be with us as a nation, that you would guide us and grant us your wisdom, that we, we may look to you as we place that X on the page. Lord God, this morning we pray for the church universal, that wherever your word is being preached, it is being preached faithfully, sincerely, pointing your people to you 
and to you alone. And so, Lord God, in response to your word, we say together the prayer that your son taught us to pray. 